Good morning, everybody. Wow, let's give it up one more time for our future. It's so good to see you all at church here today. Um, let's carry on with this song. The, the children did uh, verse one of this beautiful song. Let's uh, finish it off with verse two and three. And stand as you are able. One. Say hi to one, one another here, passing the peace. Peace be with you all. You guys did a good job. Man. Like, you know what? It totally changed. All right, come on, girls. You got to come back down front. And this next beautiful hymn is All Glory, Laud, and Honor, hymn number 280.
be seated. I invite you at this time to quiet your minds and to quiet your hearts as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, what a joy it is to celebrate Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. As the disciples gathered the colt for him to ride, people shouted Hosanna, waved palm branches, and placed their cloaks in the path of the colt. When some were cautious, Jesus reminded them that the stones would sing out. For triumph was truly coming to the holy city, triumph in a way they couldn't imagine. So we this day wave our palms, sing and shout Hosanna. We want Jesus to ride into all the places of tension and anger of our lives. We want Jesus to heal the hurts and establish his reign of peace forever. We need to shout with joy and let the shouts ring in our hearts. Bring us hope, gracious Lord, where we have allowed fear and confusion to reside. Bring us healing where we have been wounded or have been wounded by our thoughts, words, and deeds. Bring us peace where we would have been bombarded by anger and alienation. Bring us with you into the holy city, not made with human hands, but in your heavenly realm. We ask these things in the name of Christ who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. It is good to be in worship with all of you today on Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a huge deal in the life of the church. This kicks off Holy Week. It's the beginning of us experiencing the mystery of Jesus' death and resurrection. It's this amazing day where we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But to understand the triumphal entry, Entry and to understand all that's going on in the world at the time when this is going on, you have to do a little bit of research into what happened during that season, during Jesus' time. Passover was a time when Jewish people would all travel from all over the world. There would be pilgrims coming from everywhere to come to the holy city of Jerusalem to worship God, to experience Passover in Jerusalem, which was something that everyone always wanted. As I've said before, they would, if you celebrated Passover outside of Jerusalem, the traditional saying at the end is next year in Jerusalem. And it was such a season of pilgrims coming. But before Passover occurred, before the festival occurred, Rome had its own tradition. Prior to the Passover occur, festival occurring, and there would normally be a parade of pilgrims and a parade of lambs and a parade of all kinds of things, it was almost like Mardi Gras in Jerusalem. They had parades for everything when that would go on. The first parade they had was one that was a reminder. 200 years before Jesus came to Jerusalem, there was a revolt. It was the first Maccabean revolt. If you ever have a, a Bible with the Apocrypha in it, it has the books of Maccabees. In the first revolt, they overthrew Rome and gained independence again. And since that revolt, Rome, when they took back over, every year before Passover, they would have a military parade. And that military parade would happen just before the Passover festival began. And it was a reminder that Rome was allowing these people to worship their God. Not that that was a right that they had, not that that was something that couldn't be taken away. It was a reminder of the power of Rome. 
And so in the midst of this charged and tension-filled time, these people who were so long oppressed and had dealt with oppression from lots of different angles throughout their history, lots of different places throughout their history, they're yearning for the coming of a Messiah, the overthrowing of the yoke of the oppressor. They're desiring something new to come. And that's where we find ourselves in our scripture this morning in Mark 11. Beginning with verse 1, it says this, When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that he had, they had cut in the fields. And when those went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So in the midst of them wanting Jesus to come in as the one who would overthrow the yoke of oppressor, Jesus does a different thing. Now, I grew up in the age of Mel Gibson movies. They were wanting Mel Gibson's The Patriot, not Mel Gibson's The Passion, right? They wanted someone to come in who was going to be rebellious. They wanted Jesus to show up with all of his followers to overthrow the yoke of oppression, to come with their swords ready, to come with violence in their hearts, to come and send those oppressors back from whence they came. But Jesus does something different. He always does something different. Isn't that infuriating? He gives them something they didn't necessarily expect or maybe even want. How many times have you had something go away that you just didn't see coming? I had it happen to me recently. Did you watch Auburn play basketball? Man, whew, didn't expect that. I guess Yale Bulldogs were for real. But sometimes life is like that. Sometimes things don't always turn out the way we expect. Sometimes they happen in things that really matter. I mean, who wins a basketball game in the grand scheme of, of my life? It doesn't affect me very much at all. But there are times when I want God to show up and to change things, to show up and make things easier for me, to show up and teach all those people who are so wrongheaded that I am right except that's not really what God does. Very often, to quote an old pop song, you can't always get what you want, but you'll find sometimes, you might find you get what you need. Jesus didn't show up into Jerusalem to give the people what they wanted. He showed up to give them what they needed. And what they needed was something different than they could envision or imagine. So often in Scripture, when people talk to Jesus about being the Messiah, they have the wrong impression of what he has come to do. They expect this very temporal expression of religious zeal to happen. They expect things to happen in real time and tangible ways where their lives are changed, where they're elevated above those who they see are evil. They are elevated above those who they see are oppressors, where the sinners are sent to hell and the righteous get to go into heaven. They want to see this eternal judgment, and they all think that they're on the right side, right? We see that in our culture today. If you don't believe me, if you don't believe division and misery exist in the world, go on Facebook right now. It's a terrible place to be, except on our worship live stream. We encourage you to be there. But really and truly, we find ways to divide. Go and look at any political social media post. Go read the comments under any political 
news posts now that they have comments sections. And what you read is not the love and peace of Jesus Christ. You read people finding new ways to divide themselves. And you don't just see that on some things. It's really not even just political things. You see it everywhere where anyone who has a differing opinion feels like they need and cannot wait to share it with the world. To score points. To snipe at one another. To prove that they're a little bit holier than the other person next to them. To prove they're right. And it's odd that that is the way our culture behaves. But it's the way that humanity has behaved for a long time because these people who wanted Jesus to be this Messiah who kicked over the apple carts, they wanted him aimed at Rome. But what you read about just a few verses later in the Gospel of Mark is that when he comes back into Jerusalem the next day, do you know who he yells at? It isn't Rome. He goes to the temple and he flips over tables and he kicks over money changing booths and he chases livestock out of the temple with a bullwhip and he's fussing at his own people because they've made a mockery of his father's house. They've turned it into a marketplace. Jesus was concerned with the plank in their own eyes, not the speck in someone else's. And it's amazing to think about what Jesus was doing because Jesus did it on purpose. What the gospel tells us is that when he's preparing to go into Jerusalem, he sends his disciples to find a colt. And he says, and he tells them, he says, you're going to find it here. They're going to give it to you. When you say, when they ask you why you're taking it, you tell them the Lord needs it. We'll bring it back later. And I'm going to ride this colt that no one has ever ridden. And this animal is important. And this story has lots of deeply meaningful imagery in it. This colt that they go and get for Jesus, it's a colt that's never been ridden. What that means is that it's a colt that's never been put to any mundane work. It is something that has never been used in a mundane way. It is something that can be used for holy purposes. And so they go and get this colt, and not only do they go and find the colt, but this arrangement that Jesus seems to have, it's, it's one of two things, either, either A, Jesus was omniscient, which he probably is, and understood exactly where things were going to be, and knew that this would work, or, or B, he had followers in farther off places than even his disciples knew. Bible scholars debate which one is more cool, I think they're both cool, I think they were both probably true. Jesus sends these disciples and they bring this colt to him and they, they, he rides it. I don't know if you've ever been around horses much, but horses that have never been ridden, not friendly. Jesus rides this colt. And he rides a colt because it evokes a certain imagery. It reminds people of kings of the past in the Davidic line. The only other king to have done this is King Solomon, the son of David who rides into Jerusalem on a colt. And he does so because he wants people to know that he comes in peace, not as someone who is bringing war to the footsteps of God's people. So Jesus rides in, sitting on the cloaks that are draped over the back of this colt, coming as a king at peace, not at war. And I'd imagine this created some head scratching in the faithful because Jesus was not living into their intention. He wasn't doing what they wanted him to do. He wasn't what they expected him to be. He was supposed to come in and kick Rome out and let Jerusalem be free again, right? People love their freedom. We're Americans. We love our freedom. When people try to oppress us, ammo prices go up. We are serious about it. We plan on being free. It's one of the things that we believe is an inalienable right. You have freedom. And what we see in the world is people fight for their freedom all over the world. We see that in many conflicts that we have today. Whichever side you agree with, it doesn't matter. They'll tell you they're fighting for their freedom and they believe it. And the reality as Christians is that we believe Freedom is important. 
we believe that freedom is something foundational. But what we also know is the freedom we find in Christ, no one can actually take away from us because they can't take away your faith. Jesus decided that he was not going to come as this warmongering king they wanted. He came as a king who brought peace to his people. And I'm willing to bet that this peaceful attitude he brings played a big factor into people wanting to crucify him. They wanted his followers to rise up. They wanted this dissension and division to lead to a furor, to lead to a rebellion, to lead God's people into this holy crusade to throw off the yoke of the oppressors. But what Jesus was there to do was to throw off the yoke of the true oppressor of sin and of death and to create freedom not just for God's holy people, the Jewish people, the Abrahamic line, but for all people, to be able to come together and be united under the grace of God, to be given an opportunity, because what Jesus always does, and this is the part where we tend to disagree with Jesus, is he always leaves the door open and the light on for everybody. Have you ever noticed that when you read scripture? Now, Jesus is very honest. He holds people accountable. He tells them the consequences of their decisions. He tells them that, that sin leads to death. He tells them that you can make a choice to not be faithful, and the people who choose not to believe will be cast out of the outer darkness where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's in Scripture. He tells you, but he never looks at someone and says, you go to hell. He always kind of lets us know it's our choice. Our decisions have consequences. It's almost like talking to a kindergartner, right? Have you ever tried to talk to a kindergarten class? When I was a kid, kindergarten teachers were a lot meaner. But now they do things like say, now class, we need to make good choices. If you make bad choices, there are consequences. There are good choices and bad choices. And Jesus gives us all the good choices. And you know what we do? We eat the crayons and the glue anyway. We decide to make bad choices. We decide to take the bait. We decide to be led into sin. We decide ultimately that we're going to try and make Christ in our own image rather than being formed by the Son of God. We decide that Jesus agrees with us instead of allowing space for Jesus to grow us. We decide we know better than God. And it happens all the time. The only way you get to a place where you look at someone and go, they ain't worth nothing. You ever heard that saying? I've been told I wasn't worth nothing. A lot. But that's a statement that's out of sync with the reality that Jesus places on every human soul. He viewed every soul as precious. He looked at the Roman soldiers. There's a Roman centurion who he heals some of his family because the Roman centurion believes. He recognizes that all of these people are formed in the image of God. All of these people are of incredible sacred worth. And so he rides into Jerusalem as a king above the divisions of the day. A king who was there to beat swords into plowshares, to bring peace. He didn't have to ride as the king to war because he was already triumphant. The son of the living God. There was nothing that was going to be able to stop what he was willing to do. He willingly was heading for the cross. And he was going to let his faithfulness be the thing that marked who he was. His willingness to sacrificially love each and every one of us. And it's interesting to think about Palm Sunday because it's the day that Jesus ultimately makes this decision that he's going to give himself so that we all might be saved. That doesn't just happen at the Last Supper. It doesn't just happen in the Garden of Gethsemane. His riding into Jerusalem was the beginning of putting all these events into motion. 
And he does so in a gracious and beautiful way and in a way that no one expected and I'd argue in a way that many people didn't want. But he knew what we needed. He knew what kind of world we were called to build. Because what Jesus was doing was building followers and disciples who would not be people who were just conquerors of other nations, wouldn't be people who just subjected others to the same oppression they complained about. He instead wanted to create people who helped transform the world. And we know this because after his death and resurrection, the great commission that I've, we're going to be talking about at some point in the near future, with this great commission, the commission was to go out and make disciples of all nations and races. The idea was that God's grace was, a, was, was set loose in the world and that Jesus is alive. And so there is this idea beginning on Palm Sunday is Jesus, instead of Declaring Rome as the ultimate enemy shows up in peace. And ultimately, Jesus does conquer Rome. About 400 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, do you know what the Roman Empire was called? The Holy Roman Empire. Do you know what the official religion of the Holy Roman Empire was? Christianity. Jesus had the long game. Now, they weren't perfect people. If you read history books, you will know that. You'll also know that we're not perfect people. But our goal is to strive for it. Since Jesus' mighty acts, we've had 2,000 years where we could make good choices or continue eating crayons and glue. We've made some good steps, but for some reason, the blue crayons still taste good. And we've got to figure out how to move ourselves into doing new things because Jesus was doing a new thing. We have to move ourselves out of a place of complacency and sinfulness and take the next faithful steps. We have to be willing to be churches that do things to bring people to be a part of what we're doing. And we have to do so in a joyful way. Have you ever met people who are the least joyful Christians you've ever met that make Christianity sound like a bummer? I've been around those people. They're awful. Sorry, Lord, didn't mean that. But it's tough when you're around someone who all they want Christianity to be is somebody getting beaten with a book. I'm a United Methodist. We have a book of discipline. I used to think that was the book they spanked the pastors with when they did things wrong. I was half right. But I think about this idea of what does it mean to be a Christian in our modern world? What does it mean to be a joyful follower of Christ? It does mean that we have accountability. It does mean that we willingly walk away from sin. It does mean that we take faithfulness seriously. But it doesn't mean that we're con condemning people. It doesn't mean that we're hateful to people who aren't where we are yet. It means that we're making these choices because our faithfulness brings us more joy than our sinfulness. But I can tell you, friends, that not everybody's on the same page. In one church I was serving, we tried to put together an evangelism committee because I wanted to help the church grow. And I brought together all of the, the movers and shakers in the church. We had all the matriarchs and patriarchs of the church and all of the young people who were volunteering to do all the things. And we were building this evangelism committee. And I, I got in there and I said, guys, I need your help. I need you to start inviting your friends and your neighbors and your coworkers to church. We want to grow this church and see how we can make an impact in the world. I need, I need to ask you to try and share your faith. And one of the most influential people in the church was sitting in the back of the room with their arms crossed, which is always a good sign right that's always you, you can tell you have a victory there and they called out we have a sign with our service times they know what we do here if they want to come they'll come no they won't not even a little bit I grew up in the 90s some churches did a really great job discipling students some churches did a really great job developing intentional worship for students. And those places are still thriving and vibrant. One of the reasons we have children's worship here is because we want to teach our kids how to worship. And very soon, we're going to start this, this next communion Sunday. We're going to have children's worship, and they're going to have communion so they can understand it. And I value that our church is a place where we emphasize worship 
with our children. Because a lot of the kids I grew up with never went to a worship service. Not a single, there wasn't a children's worship service and there wasn't an adult worship service they ever darkened the doors of. We went to daycare. We went and colored some pictures for Jesus. And we read stories and we learned the Bible stories and the volunteers did their best, but we never learned to worship. One of the things I'm proud of is our church is teaching the kids to worship. You saw them singing up here. What an improvement our children's choir has had as they learned to worship. I know two of them, the first time they sang, they did this. They're mine, so I can say that. They actually sang today and waved their palm branch. And I think about this idea of teaching children to worship on their level so that way when they grow up, worship is the expectation. They understand what it means. But if you think that the sign on 98 is going to reach those who have never been in worship, who have never understood the value of church, you're crazy. And then once they get here, if church is boring and lifeless and nobody's happy and everyone looks like they're miserable and just waiting for lunch, do you know what, how often they're going to come back? Never. Because Sunday morning TV programming is just more interesting. But when our community of faith is joyful, when we're the people who love each other, when we take care of each other, when we develop small groups, when we sing the praises of God, when we're invested in our worship and in our study and in our community, when we're loving each other, when we're covering over sins of our neighbor with grace, when we're working through our divisions and struggles together, when we're reflecting the grace of God clearly and appropriately, you know what happens? It's infectious. People want to be a part of that community. But our attitude and our decisions matter. Recently in my life, I got a title that means a great deal to me. Many of you will think it's my educational degree I got. Yay, I'm a doctor, hooray. But I'm a baseball coach. That's fun. Yeah. I have 12 seven and eight year olds that I get to help coach. They all know what I do for a living. So when they hit me with a bat, I have to be an, a saintly person. I can't say what I'm thinking. And what's interesting is because they know who I am and what I do, and because the other coaches know what I do for a living, the conversations that happen even at a baseball field are amazing. I had one kid ask me at least 45 questions about Jesus during a batting practice. I tried to answer all of them. Some of them, I just didn't know the answer. He asked me if Jesus liked aliens, and I said, I don't know. But that's a great question I'll ask when I get there. Hopefully not anytime soon. But I think about this idea of even on that baseball field, transformation can occur. The way I treat these little boys, the way I treat the teams we play, the way I talk to the coaches, the way I talk to the umpires, the way I live out my faithfulness matters. That's true at the baseball field, it's true at home, it's true at work, it's true at even Walmart. And that place needs Jesus. And now our new favorite place is Aldi, and because I'm a Christian, I have to leave my quarter inside the shopping cart so someone else can use it, because that's what Christians do. But I think about this idea of what it looks like to actually be joyful in my faithfulness, to celebrate my Christianity, to take every opportunity to share and witness to the goodness and mercy of God, to talk about faith with people that want to hear. One of the coaches I talked to came to me and he said, hey, we're launching a youth group. Do you, have any, do you have any help that you could give me? And I looked at him and I said, oh boy, do we. And I hope he reaches out so we can help him. Because I want to see every church in Navarre get full. I want to see disciples of Jesus 
Christ made all over our community. I want to see our church partner with other churches as we seek to deal with the hard issues in our community. I want to see us band our resources because what I know is that when God's people decide to move in the same direction, when we decide to see the value in one another, when we decide to put our divisions and differences aside and claim the unity we have in Christ that Jesus so beautifully gave as an example even on Palm Sunday as he rode into Jerusalem as a king, when we claim that unity and work together, there's not a problem in this world we can't fix. And God has created a beautiful and good world for us. I know that because I go to the beach. We live in one of the most beautiful places on earth. I go out there and I like to watch the sunset because if you're watching the sunrise, you got up too early. And I enjoy watching the dolphins, watching the kids play, watching people try to paddleboard and fail. That's one of my favorite things. <laughs> but I look around and every time I'm struck in awe at what God has created for us. And for those moments when I'm sitting and just thinking and being grateful, I feel the stresses and the pressures and the worries of life kind of melt away for just a few minutes. But it doesn't take long, does it, when you drive back across that bridge for all of it to come piling back down on you. But God created something good for us. And we can choose to be joyful. We can choose to have good days. We can choose to let Christ's light shine in us no matter what we're facing. We can choose to be faithful people. And sometimes when we feel like we're not strong enough, you know what our neighbors and friends in Christ can do? They can choose to be Christ with us and for us and carry us over the finish line. Because it's going to take every single one of us loving each other and loving our God in a transformational way if we want to see the world become what we hope it can be. A place where there is joy where there is safety, where there is hope, where oppression is no more, where sin and death no longer have the reign and the hold over us that they have, but it's going to take faithfulness. Faithfulness like Jesus showed to us. Faithfulness like God has shown to us for thousands and thousands of years. It's going to take us making a decision to walk faithfully, to not let division and anger and deciding that Jesus agrees with only us as the position we take, but instead to give grace, to be faithful, to love people right where they are, and to reflect the same grace and love that Jesus did. Because you know what's amazing about Jesus? He never slammed the door on anybody's face. He told them the consequences of their actions, yes, but the door was always unlocked and the light was always on. He told everyone, you're one choice away from being where you need to be. This morning, we had people choose to join our church in the first service. Our church is still growing. We're still launching new things. We're still trying new things. We're still doing new things. And you know what? Sometimes we're going to do things and they're not going to work. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to go, well, that didn't work. And we're going to try something else. Because that's the resiliency we have to have. We have to be willing to be the kind of people who continually take the next step forward, who continually remain faithful, who continually make the decision day in and day out that we're going to be God's people in the place that God has placed us and do all the good we can with all that we have and all that we are because the world was made by God and it is good. And the souls around us are precious and of incredible worth not only to God, but they should be of incredible worth to each of us. So if I could encourage you this Palm Sunday as you take your palm branches with you and worship, I hope you'll place them somewhere you think about them. Because this week is all about the, deci the decision that Christ made that saved every single one of us. And it's also a time where we can look and reflect and make our own decision about how we're going to be Christ for the world as Christians, as followers, as disciples, and as people of joy. Because our God has saved us. And he did so on purpose. 
And he believed that we were valuable. But he had work for us to do. So let us as God's people think about how we can be more and become more of what God needs us to be to serve this present age. Make disciples that continue to transform the world. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this chance to gather and worship and in praise. We thank you for the words found in our gospel text, for these beautiful songs that we sing. God, we pray that your spirit would meet us, that you would transform us, that you would give us your heart and your spirit and help us not to get lost in the negativity we can find in the world, but instead to experience your goodness, and your mercy and your grace. Help us be your joyful followers who even when we face hard things still have your light reflecting from our hearts. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able as we affirm our faith together using the historic words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as our ushers come forward. We give thanks for a beautiful place of worship where we are able to gather together and journey through Holy Week and beyond. Let us pray. What can we offer that you have not already offered us? What can we do that you have not already done for us? Lord Jesus Christ, in your gifts to us, you have provided us the way to live and serve you. In both your triumph and your suffering, you deserve our praise. Through the gifts we now offer, we express our longing to serve and to follow wherever you go. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Paul. As we uh, prepare for this special song, I just want to really quick let you all know, as our ushers walk, with uh, I, huge gratitude to our, our choir here. Um, for the most of you that have been here from the beginning, you remember how we had pretty much... <laughs> Jeannie and I was the only ones really that did it, and uh, just every one of these folks here are, are not only close friends of mine or family, but they're also my teachers and stuff. They've, they've taught me a lot, and, uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce you to my assistant, uh, Ms. Julia Fitzpatrick. Um, she's going to do a very special song for you on, on this one, and uh, this song is uh, called the holy city.
Julia Fitzpatrick. Hymn number 370, Victory 